to imagine that what was seen was a hallucination. Some take this recent sighting as evidence that the Flatwoods monster has returned. Others, however, are skeptical and believe that mass hysteria is a more likely explanation. Nausea is a symptom of hysteria. So can be other physical reactions. For example, you can lose your voice or you can cough. There's a sort of a visceral effect that the that hysteria can have, a sort of physiological effect. There is what's called mass hysteria, a contagious reaction among people that, that one person can spark. If one person panics, other people may panic. Nickel believes the original sighting was exaggerated, a product of its time. You, you will search, I think, in vain for a case quite like vain for a case quite like Flatwoods prior to 1952. If we look at this in the Cold War context, there was a kind of general mass hysteria. The, the general climate was such that uh, people were looking to the skies. Nichols says the publicity surrounding the first sighting colored the accounts that came afterward. Once you get a report, it sparks other reports. This is what is well known as contagion. The Flatwoods case got a lot of attention. It got newspaper media attention, and it, it set up almost a new genre of, of a type of monster. The power of suggestion is very strong. You can have something on the mind, something put out there, and people start looking for it and focusing on it, and they will, they will report it. They will see it. The expedition team has suspended a highly sensitive infrared thermal camera from a helium balloon 150 feet in the air. It will show any heat sources for a mile in any direction. The team is hoping that this thermal technology will identify what witnesses have seen here. They saw the Flatwoods Monster craft touch down in the back area here, John. I think we got a hot spot up there, Frank. Closer examination reveals that the hot spot that the team saw on the hillside was a buildup of residual heat beneath an opening in a canopy of shade trees. The next morning, the team moves down the hilltop to the spot where the hunter reported an encounter with three humanoid creatures. The trail leading into the site is nearly impassable. One theory holds that the encounters were hallucinations caused by the release of gases that form around the massive coal deposits that run close to the surface. Now, for the first time, the sighting area will be thoroughly checked for toxic gas releases. We were looking for carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide, all of which could have been present in the area because of mining operations of coal being released in the atmosphere. Nothing registers. The area is clear. Monster Quest science team is testing what may be a hybrid monster humanoid skull, measuring its unusual density. Forensic anthropologist Dr. Susan Meister will subject the skull to the shore hardness test. This will gauge its resistance and show if it is greater than that 
of a human skull. The shore hardness test was designed to look at the strength of a material, like a polymer or ceramics, in order to assess its strength um, against forces being applied to it. So we thought that by applying the shore hardness test to bone, uh, we may be able to get some insight into the strength of the bone. The test will be applied to three skull samples. The supposed hybrid skull, a normal adult skull, and the skull of a child. A durometer will measure the resistance the skull makes on a spring-loaded needle. Forensic artist Bill Munns is using a cast of the skull to rebuild the face of the creature. He hopes this reconstruction will determine whether it resembles the elongated head and oversized glowing eyes described by witnesses to the Flatwoods monster. The eye socket itself is unusually shallow. Munns has already rebuilt the missing jaw and unusually small teeth. He moves on to the unconventional eyes. The first reaction would be to simply put a round eye in it, but it would tend to bulge out almost like a frog eye. And I felt that biologically that's not likely. So what I did for the eye in this particular case is actually first design in a computer the shape of an eyeball that would allow a very, very large flat back area where all of it's in focus at once. And then simply round it out so it was a form of a kind of a compressed oval. And that sat into the eye socket perfectly. The eye would not be able to rotate terribly well left, right, up, down, but because the entire retina is in focus at the same time, it allows for in-focused peripheral vision, so you don't actually need to rotate the eye. Munns begins reconstructing the neck muscles and discovers something unusual. Within a normal human being, they're usually sufficiently inside the neck area that the neck can still have kind of a basic round cylindrical form. In this particular instance, those processes where the muscle actually attaches to at the base of the skull were extended way out to the side of the face, and it produced a very, very unusual neck shape. Finally, the face of the monster humanoid emerges. Once the face itself was fleshed out, I could forget about all the musculature underneath it, forget about all of the skull structure and bone structure underneath it, step back and really just take a look at this face for the first time. Monster Quest is searching for evidence of strange humanoid creatures seen in West Virginia more than half a century ago. This man says he came face to face with a monster in 1952. This investigator believes he may have found physical evidence of the beast. This author believes that this skull is a 900 year old hybrid humanoid. And this forensic anthropologist may finally be able to determine its origin. Dr. Susan Meister has completed her analysis of the skull. My findings indicate that it is the skull of a child. I came to that conclusion uh, based on the fact that the morphology is consistent with a human child, uh, the dentition is consistent with a human child, uh, the shape and contour and size of the skull are consistent with a human child. It proved impossible to determine gender or ancestry of the individual. But Dr. Meister was able to uncover some details about the skull. There was no evidence of disease um, observable on the skull. And there, the modification was also not due to warping or due to a burial environment. And the more I looked at the skull, the more I became convinced that the modification to the skull was intentionally inflicted um, as part of a cultural practice. Some Native American tribes have historically bound their infants' still soft skulls to cause them to grow into an elongated shape, a practice known as cradle boarding. 
we have seen cranial modification, intentional cranial modification in almost all parts of the world. It's not cradle boarding, but it's, it is modification uh, to the occipital region or the back of the skull. If it is an intentional modification, it is unlike any Dr. Meister has encountered before. I've never seen modification like this, um, to this extent, or even close to this extent. The, the degree of modification seen in this particular skull is more significant and to a greater degree than I've seen in any other skull I've analyzed. The results of the shore hardness test suggest the skull is made of a substance harder than normal human bone. The uh, shore hardness test was conducted on three separate individuals. Uh, the first individual was the skull that we've been analyzing, the star child. Uh, the second individual was an adult human female and the third individual was a human child and what we saw was that the two definitively human skulls uh, were within the acceptable range 65 to 85 uh, using the shore hardness scale uh, and that the star child uh, was a little bit higher uh, but still within that upper 80s and we had one reading in the 90s When I went into this, I didn't have any head or face visualized in my mind that I was aspiring to accomplish. And I was actually surprised. The reconstruction reveals a face that does not look entirely human. The team has gathered samples from the site where the creature was first seen in 1952. Soil, parts of a decayed tree, and a black plastic-like material that was scattered over the ground. There was a good variety of wood samples and soil samples that were tested. The two analysis, the one with uh, the mass spectrometer that I absolutely identified any compounds present, match that with the gas chromatograph and the more sensitive detector. There were no semi-volatile or volatile materials that were unusual uh, that was associated with this. Analysis of the black particles reveal they were natural organic materials charred as if subjected to extreme heat. The estimate that I gave with this was that it was either very decayed wood or uh, charcoal of some type. More than half a century ago, witnesses saw something that could not be explained. It's the old scientific thing about extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof and extraordinary level of proof. This expedition has revealed some interesting facts. No sign of radiation or toxic contamination was found in Flatwoods, West Virginia. But there was charred organic matter there, giving credibility to what the witnesses saw. No gas leaks were found that could explain their stories as hallucinations. And a comparison of witness descriptions shows they were likely seeing the same thing. I've met little kids who have told me stories, five years old, and people in their 90s. And what's very interesting is the amount of Braxton County residents who walk up to me and say, do you know 